Live from the San Jose Convention Center, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering Hadoop Summit 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Hortonworks, and by EMC, Pivotal, IBM, Pentaho, Teradata, SyncSort, and by Attunity. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley at Hadoop Summit 2015. This is theCUBE, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle, showing my co-host, Wikibon's new big data analyst, George Gilbert, from Wikibon.com. And our next guest got two great guests, Ryan Peterson, Chief Solutions Strategist at EMC, and Scott Now, CTO at Hortonworks. Welcome back to theCUBE. Guys, back again, together, the EMC, place to be. Hortonworks, welcome to theCUBE. This is the place to hang out at this event, I'm telling you. You guys, are, you guys were on earlier individually, but I want to talk about the, uh, the storage aspect of, um, of big data. Yeah. Okay, we were just talking earlier on with Scott about the issues of you know, how to get customers in a situation where they don't get a large cost increase when they have success, or right. create some, some sort of foolproof environment where you can have some agility and flexibility for the app guys. So what, you know, as an architect person in the enterprise, how do they figure this out, Ryan? I mean, because you know, I don't want to get locked into EMC, I don't want to get locked into NetApp or anybody else, I want, but I want my data to be free, yeah. you know? Yeah, I know, we, I know we've talked about this to Mass, and I, I completely agree. You've got to maintain flexibility across all of the stack, and, and whether that's uh, swapping out the, the particular storage infrastructure, making that available, or, or swapping out the, uh, the distribution for the right distribution, or having the right tool sets, uh, being able to put whatever application you want, you've got to make sure that flexibility, that, that uh, avoidance of vendor lock-in, uh, and as much as I work for a storage company and want to try to lock in my storage infrastructure, the uh, reality is that uh, customers need that choice, they need that flexibility, or it's just not going to work out long term for them. And I think one of the things about this being in the software business, what interesting was in EMC world, um, Jeremy Burton said that I think 90% of the engineering is, or maybe 95% mm -hmm. is software, not hardware. Yeah, in fact, we very rarely talk about hardware anymore. It's, uh, we, you know, think about it, we, we create one FS as a uh, storage system for Isilon as an example. Most of that's all just code on the software side. Uh, to some extent, it's it's what uh, the community is doing around HDFS, and and that's where the one competitive point is between uh, you know EMC and, and actual community. Uh, everything else is really the the whole stack. We love it, we support it, and that's the that's how we go to market. What's interesting, we had talked to um, Scott Con Sean Connolly, and he's like giving us you know he's the strategy guy. He's got the chessboard. And he's always fun to talk to because he's got he's got color to the way he describes it. But I asked him, you know, why are you guys winning? And he said, you know, the analyst who did the uh, research analyst who was up on stage, Del, um, uh, what's his name? Thomas uh, Del Grecchio, I think it's um, uh, was on stage with the yeah. research guy. He said the um, important versus winning the largest deals in terms of large enterprise, not largest number, but like mm -hmm. big enterprises. And 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 I asked him why that was the case. And what was interesting was Scott was is that as the companies get organic growth of deployments inside the company, it's diverse. You have a little bit of Isilon here, or EMC, you got open source over here, and then they got to rein it in. It's not shadow IT, because it's actually happening inside the company. Right. So it's going on, and at some point they go, well, okay, we got to kind of rein this in. It seems that's where we are right now, so how does someone figure this out? How do, if I'm an architect in a large enterprise, it's not just an RFP, I actually got to think this through. I got to say, okay, how do I rein it in without disrupting the innovation? Mm. That's the question, Scott. How will you look at that as, as, a, as an architect? Yeah. Okay, rein it in, but don't screw up any innovation. <laughs> well, it's not easy, it's, it's somewhat daunting, right? But I think it really does get back to trying to define the data fabric for the organization at a logical level. And then really looking at the total cost uh, to the organization, right? And the different uh, standards that have been implemented across the organization and where does the intersection of the data fabric logically land based on different use cases in the standards that have been chosen, right? And so, like we've been talking, it, it's about ecosystem flexibility and having choice and then and letting those architects have freedom to go uh, design and define what they want versus kind of the other way around, I've chosen a standard, therefore everything is going to be this. Uh, Ryan, I got to ask you the EMC question. I know you're a little bit different inside EMC because you got technical background and you're kind of got a, like a visionary DevOps vibe to you. Um, the old EMC, the old go back in the old days, very competitive, very sales oriented culture. Win the account, elbows out, lock everyone out, win everything. 
burn the village, EMC wins. Because back then, storage was, you could be a single vendor storage. And, sure. and when you had email to store and some files. Now it's big, it's huge. So, and with the growth of data, EMC doesn't even have to do much to win because there's more demand for storage than ever before. The only thing that EMC has to do is provide a great solution for developers yeah. to store stuff. Yeah. That's DevOps. Yeah. Did I get that? So that's that the vision of EMC? I mean, if you just get out of the way of the innovation and just be the best storage for apps and data. Yeah, I think in general, uh, as you know, we've gone through a pretty significant transition over yeah. the last uh, couple of years, especially. Uh, companies started off with a, a bunch of scale-up applications, uh, really made its way through the mainframe era, um, and, and been around for a long time, owns a very significant portion of the business. Um, what's changed is, is really the entire persona of how EMC is going. We, we like to say uh, uh, EMC is no longer uh, your, your father's EMC. Uh, and, and by that means, uh, you know, people like Jeremy Burton and, uh, and, and, and Jonathan are, are going out and, and they're, they're changing the vibe, the, the culture completely. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're jeans wearing, although I'm not today, um, jeans, jeans wearing, t-shirt wearing, try to join the Silicon Valley in a, a, a direction of things. And, uh, and as a result, we're, we're doing things like open sourcing projects. And uh, I think when I started at AMC, I would have never thought that uh, that, that would have been a direction for us. And yet, uh, just just a few weeks ago, we open sourced our, our first uh, set of projects, and I think we have uh, about five or six or seven projects already open sourced. I expect that to be a continued trend as we'll continue to to look at how we change our business model to to fit in and match in with the way the uh, the world is going. It's it's a very Scott, unique. Scott, talk about this because we were just talking about in your segment about Presto and open source. There's now a playground and an, and, a, and an, a real track for these trains to run on for big companies to transform themselves with open source. How does a company transform themselves to be, to be open source? Because in the old days, open source was a way to kind of get in, well not open source, but standards bodies, which open source basically is in a way a de facto standards body, the way the community self polices itself. Vendors would go in and meddle and screw things up and try to have agendas, IT, yeah, it's a long list of history we all seen in the past, but now with open source is more community based, those shenanigans don't happen because the community will self-police. It's like its own, you know, governing body, if you will. But how does a company, like a big company, come in and do open source? Uh, it, well, <laughs> I think the, the number one, stepping up to go do it, takes some. Uh, it takes some strategic thinking, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to be the norm. Uh, and number two, encouraging a community to get built around the, the code that's been distributed uh, is, is, I think, a very important part of the credibility factor that comes with, yeah, it's open source, but it's still kind of a single code base that you know two guys wrote versus a community of people that are actually making contributions, uh, trying to compete for better algorithms. I mean, you know, the whole beauty of open source is that you get more eyeballs on the problem, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so promoting that community aspect, I think, is a really important part. So taking the strategic step to do it mm -hmm. is, is probably you know, a white knuckle decision in some boardrooms. But then, you know, yeah, investing, in, <laughs> investing in to build the community, I think, is, well, I mean, is it's a key it, success factor. It's a whole new customer constituency, if you think about it that way. It's the old book from Dale Carnegie, you had to win friends and influence people. Yeah. In open source, there's, there's a playbook for that. It's called Build Good Code and, yeah. <laughs> and ingratiate into the community. But that's actually, you, do you have to build open source in from the start, or can you take something that was built proprietary and the code base was you know, the thought process is different. And, I mean, of course anyone can publish the source code, mm -hmm. but is it the same as designing it to be open source? I'll take that, it's an interesting question because we just did this. So, uh, we built a software called Viper Controller. Uh, we put tons of money into going out and marketing this Viper Controller software. And, and of course it's made, made quite a big splash. Uh, but we realized at some point that, that what we were doing with this needed adoption by other companies outside of EMC. It needed other storage industry providers, for example, to start integrating into the solution. We were finding that, you know, because we created it, that they weren't really that interested. We took our code as we developed it and we, we open sourced that. We, we, we actually literally placed it up and we, we recalled it uh, Copperhead. And so uh, Copperhead went out uh, just a few weeks ago and, and I expect that to make actually significant changes to even Hadoop because as we started to uh, integrate into ultimately different uh, storage systems that are already in the data center, uh, reutilizing those assets. Uh, how can we do things like take uh, Ambari or Yarn and, and start integrating directly into those, uh, those storage systems, uh, hit a, a click of a button, 
well, that's what uh, Viper Controller was built to do. And uh, and now we've open sourced it. So we didn't we didn't go and let's ground up build it for open source. Okay. We took the code that had already been developed and said, uh, so here you go. So uh, it's not necessarily in the the format that maybe the open source community would want it, but it's uh, it's there and it's clean and. Guys, talk about the relationship between EMC and Hortonworks. Obviously, Hortonworks' whole strategy is, is pretty clear. Open source, all pure, all open all the time. Mm -hmm. Consumption with ODP and equivalent, and which is close ecosystems, right? So ecosystem partnering is a big deal for Hortonworks. So talk about the relationship. Obviously, enterprises, you guys have huge presence, EMC and the enterprise storage. Mm -hmm. and like I said, you just, it's, you're already there. Hortonworks is evolving, emerging as a leader in open source, <laughs> large enterprise standardizations. What's the relationship? I can, I can tell you how it started. It was uh, prior, to, prior to Scott coming on board, but it's, uh, you know, we had customers, joint customers who said, hey, we've, we've got Isilon, we, we, we want to put Hortonworks against the uh, Isilon cluster. How do, we, how do we do that? And of course, that, that forces some conversations in the very beginning, and we say, hey, well, you do want to work together, do you want to, and, and ultimately, um, we, we launched this relationship in, in February, officially, and, and already we have dozens of, of up and running installed customer base, so I think it's, uh, it's successful in that in that regard, um, how we how we take it to the next step is you know do we do we build better hooks, better integration? Uh, do we just make it easier for, for our uh, customers to consume? So for example, we built uh, Ambari plugins directly into our code set. So uh, if uh, if Ambari reaches out to an EMC uh, cluster, we respond with all of the right requests that uh, that, that a normal uh, Hadoop implementation would want. And so uh, so doing those things, I think, is is helpful in providing a, a good integration. Um, but uh, I'm going to yeah, I, I don't know that I can add a whole lot more other than, yeah, customer demand and customer choice is, mm -hmm. is really, really important. And we talked about it before. There's the logical view, and then there's the physical implementation view. And in this world, it's not going to be one size fits all on how things get deployed. So creating more choices and making sure that the choices are tested, certified, and we can build better engineering together, mm -hmm. I think is, is key. Yeah, to and, but success, to your point, right? we talked earlier about this data being free thing. This is really kind of a key mm -hmm. thing on my mind, still getting my head around that, which is, if I'm a developer and I'm driving data, I need to have that data available. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get caught in a net of migration. Area. So, how do you guys address that? EMC, I mean, answer that question. Do we? Do we? Do you, yeah, how we, do you help me if I'm an app developer? So you're not developer. Using, we we agree. Horton works. Hadoop. I'm in. Yeah. But I don't want to get stuck. If I'm successful, I'm going to blow up in costs just to kind of do maybe better stuff down the road. Well, I think uh, Hadoop implementations always seem to start pretty small. You know, if you're 20 nodes, you're probably actually a, a pretty decent size install for a beginning cluster. And uh, what, what tends to be the problem is not when you're starting out, it's when you get to very successful range and now you're having to figure out how you manage uh, potentially thousands of nodes. Uh, and sometimes you didn't plan for that. Your, your data center's not ready for that. So, uh, you know, the power, the cooling, uh, you don't have the resources of Yahoo and Google to go out and build a new data center on the water to, to cool your infrastructure. And so what we do is we try to, you know, uh, look at those kinds of things. How can we bring down the cost? So, for example, we have uh, Erasure Coding's already uh, been built into Isilon for many years. Uh, uh, with ECS, which is our, uh, our, our geoscale solution, uh, we, we do Erasure Coding across different uh, nodes and along with XORing to try and reduce the, uh, the overall load. I'd really try to keep that, that cost very efficient, as, as low as possible, add feature sets that care about efficiency like deduplication. So not only do erasure code, but we also dedupe uh, blocks at the 8K level. I mean, some really great things to try and try and keep it down. Uh, finally, and, and I think something you and I have actually uh, talked about before is, uh, we, we try to keep it open and flexible to the tool set that you're going to ultimately consume the data with. Uh, a great example is of customers using Splunk in Iceland, uh, and quite a, quite a few. Uh, and those customers are ultimately looking at, uh, I want to look at the same data that I brought into Splunk, uh, now with Hortonworks. Well, how do I do that? Uh, and and we, we're one of the only solutions that I know of that can ingest all of that data from Splunk, drop it into a central data repository, and ultimately uh, data becomes available to Hortonworks in the, in the next step. So guys, talk about, so I'm going to get your perspective on a more technical question. You know, in the in tech industry, we had Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. Moore's Law would increase the performance, price drops and performance, so then it's a new processor, which is high price. And then Moore's Law continues again, and that created a lot of innovation. Is there a similar metaphor or analog in the open source Hadoop world or mm -hmm. the big data world we live in that could be, not necessarily a Moore's Law, but some Moore's Law like where I can understand the cadence of innovation? Because what we're really talking about here is if this plays out, then things like Docker containers, Kubernetes orchestration in the cloud mm -hmm. 
expand the overall function. Now, certainly virtualization's done a lot to change the game. So as all this tech comes together, this operating system builds out, I mean, it's, it's like a main, distributed mainframe, if you will. Yeah. So how do we think about the cadence of innovation? Is there a way to think about, have you guys thought about that? Any personal thoughts uh, on, on this? Well, yeah, certainly cadence is an important thing, right? And, and the more mature something gets, the more it will start to slow down. And, and so that's why I actually believe that the model that we're building where we rely heavily, at Hortonworks at least, on the Apache community and being very open for the innovation and then being able to, at a regular cadence that's predictable for our customers, kind of draw a circle around the latest of each of those things, package it up, do the testing, make sure it's supportable, and make sure there are no regressions in it so that it's dependable when we release it. That, that's kind of the best of both worlds. So we're not limited on the input, but we will at least uh, look to uh, contain the output so that it's predictable for enterprises. By the way, you know, if companies want to get ahead of the release, they can go to the open source and pull it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, do it at kind of at your own. Uh, at yeah, your own yeah. Peril, and those right? are the guys who are the the guys who eat eat glass and spit nails. Are those are the, exactly. the hardcore guys? <laughs> They've got to get at. Give me some of that you know, code. You know, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Pull their but own I, Linux <laughs> distro. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, I do think. Uh, I do think it's important uh, for all of us to work with the community to try to keep it from slowing down and getting it, you know, as committees get larger, sometimes decisions get slower. Um, and, and so, luckily, we haven't seen a slowing of the cadence to date. Uh, and, you know, certainly part of our strategy is to make sure that that doesn't happen, right? Yeah, and it's having good projects out there that provide value to me. Yeah. But is there just the structure of Apache, since they're not the ones trying to put all the pieces together, it's almost like, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. I don't know if you were the one who said that earlier. I mean, ODP is the one that's then got to package it up into something that is consumable. Yeah, kind of. I see that kind of as a separate thing, but also somewhat important. Uh, in that, I think for the industry, for the the Hadoop landscape in general, I do believe that it's extremely important that we figure out a way to agree on a common kernel at certain points in time to make it easier for app developers to be able to develop their apps and not have to worry about this distro versus that distro, mm -hmm. only really looking at kind of the kernel version, just the, the way Linux works today, right? But isn't that ODP's role? And certainly that, that is the goal of, uh, of ODP, to, to, to try to create at least that common set of services for, um, for application developers so they can have kind of a, a, a universal thing to test with. Um, you know, one of the worst things that I think we could do as an industry is to let that kernel fragment into multiple different things. I totally agree. Uh, and, 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 and then it would just not be sustainable and, and the innovation would actually slow down dramatically. Yeah, yeah, I, agree. I would agree 100% with that. Yeah. What's your take on this whole cadence? Is there a way we can, the common tech person could like just understand, think of it like a journalist or a blogger out there, it's just like, okay, it's, it's good, things are healthy, green light, go. No, you I, know. I have an interesting thought on this, so a couple thoughts, one is, uh, you know, I've always been told that whenever you have an idea, someone already had it, uh, there's a good chance that somebody's already implemented it. Um, I, I think a lot of our cadence uh, development comes from uh, organizations pushing us to be innovative. And to the extent that, hey, why haven't you guys put this into the environment yet? Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. With it. Yeah, let, you know, let's put that on the list and let's take a look and see you know, if it makes sense for the overall organization. I guess my point is that I think um, it's not even say a cadence as much as it's a it's a it's just a raw speed of development and innovation. People constantly have a different thought and they're, they're putting that into the next thing. If there's an opportunity to innovate or an opportunity to make money on it, then somebody's going to put it into place and they're going to try to try to make it happen. I think we're going to start seeing things that uh, nobody ever thought uh, would happen with Hadoop in the very beginning. I think we're going to see applications developed and we're not going to be talking about big data or analytics or any of the things that traditionally are the stories today. I think we're just going to be talking about scale out applications of the data center. I think that's going to be the future. And when that starts to happen, the whole, the whole new level of innovation. It's really hard to think about because, you know, I asked the question because it's a mind bender of an exercise because, you know, if you believe Rob Bearden's electricity comment in the keynote, which is very interesting, mm -hmm. it enables more stuff, mm -hmm. obviously <laughs> luxury and quality of life increases. Mm -hmm. And then Herb was talking about railroad standardization. You know, the standardization of, of having this fertile soil, if you will, with, mm -hmm. with Hadoop. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. So so it, it might be that there's no, <laughs> it, it might not be any cadence, it might be just be a complete changeover. <laughs> it, so, I, you know, yeah. to me, I'm trying to figure that out. How do I describe the level of innovation from Hadoop 
and well, big data at a level that people can understand. It's really challenging. We, we study history to determine what the future will look like. And if you look at history, this has been a repeating pattern. It hasn't happened, in my opinion, in this particular industry, we'll call it the, the data center at scale. And so what we've had is things like Microsoft Windows, Windows 1.0, I remember it was a lot of custom development, custom programming, and then all of a sudden 311 comes around and you've got a pretty stable platform, and then Windows 95, everyone just adopted ma uh, massively. Of course, the same thing happens with the, the iPhone. You know, the, the device comes out, starts out to just a handful of applications. Now, that, now I mean, what, there's a million something plus apps out there. But it was the, the platform had to get created, developers had to start understanding it, the applications start to innovate, and all of a sudden, as soon as there's applications that are changing the world, then all of a sudden that's, uh, that drives the infrastructure, drives the play all the way to the bottom. Okay, I think so things are where we're at. We got to wrap, but yep. I want to get just closing comments from you guys, just last word. Good relationship, I look good to see EMC and Horton work partnering well together. Um, what's next for EMC? What's next for you guys in this open source? Uh, Roadmap for you guys: more coders, more more action meetups, crowd chats, cube interviews. What are you guys going to be doing out there to get the word out? How are you recruiting people? Just give us a, an insight of what's on the agenda for the next year for you guys. You know, the next big thing is we, we've taken and uh, broken up our, our strategy into multiple components. The components are uh, how do we uh, continue to go with the, the data lake strategy that we've been going really well with with Hortonworks, for example, um, and, and then start to look at the, the fringe cases where things just don't work today. We think Flash, for example. Uh, very, very high speed uh, flash performance, getting into the, the millions of IOP uh, range uh, in, in very small talking windows. DSSD. Yeah, we're talking about DSSD. <laughs> and uh, sort of looking at, at uh, DSSD as an example, uh, cloud scale applications like what we're doing with ECS, uh, integration of ECS to full automation. We're, we're looking at, at how can we give you guys choice from a customer perspective, how can you give you choice to put any particular platform underneath this great scale out tool set of Hadoop? All right. Scott, anything, that final word you want to share with the folks out there? I agree, I would just say the data lake is not a one size fits all thing mm -hmm. and it's going to become even less a one size fits all thing over time as the use cases evolve. Mm -hmm. And so having choices, uh, uh, like we mentioned, SSD, rotational drives, high capacity drives, and what we mm -hmm. see you know, from hardware vendors coming in the future is there going to be a lot more choices. So being able to integrate that and provide flexibility at an API level for our customers, I think is a joint value add. Integration and growth, that's a big theme here. Yep. Guys, thanks for joining us. This is theCUBE, we're getting, <laughs> getting the hook, we're going along on these good segments. We'll be right back after this short break. This is theCUBE, live in Silicon Valley, Hadoop Summit 2015.